last week we started talking about God with us and focusing on the doctrine of the incarnation. Last week as we began to talk about this, we came to the conclusion that the doctrine of the incarnation is one of the most important doctrines of the Christian faith, right along with the virgin birth. You know, if Christ wasn't sinless, then he could not have paid the price for our salvation because the Bible says the soul that sins must die and a blood offering had to be sacrificed and it, in the Old Testament that law said that it had to be spotless and without blemish and, and you know they would have to go through their, their flocks and figure out you know uh, what was qualified to do that and so obviously Jesus being a man in likeness of human flesh stepped out of eternity into time and became the ultimate sacrifice so that is very, very important, Jesus being born of a sinless, uh, being of a sinless nature. But also important, like we talked about last week, is the incarnation, which literally means God in flesh. God in flesh. So Jesus was 100% God and 100% man. He wasn't 50-50. And at no time did he ever cease to be God, and at no time did he ever cease to be man. The miracles that Jesus did, this is kind of blows our mind a little bit, but the miracles that Jesus did, the walking on the water, the calming of the storm, the healing of the blind, listen, don't, don't mess up with me right here. Jesus did those things not as God. He did them as man, though he never ceased. We're going to read that uh, in a, when we come back from our uh, Christmas break in Colossians. He never ceased being God, but Acts chapter 10, verse 38, plainly tells us, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth, and part of that anointing, when God anointed the human side of Christ, was to enable him to do the works. And so it was I interesting. So anyway, don't get hung up on that. It's kind of semantics, but you go and look at it, and it's really awesome. But, but what we see is, is that Jesus was God in flesh. And we ended last week's teaching by showing you that Jesus was very human. As a baby, he cried. As a baby, Mary would have to pacify him, I'm sure. We know that when Jesus was about 12, 13 years old and he was uh, presented himself in the temple before the priests and the rabbis and everything that Mary and Joseph, they left him. They lost him. They didn't know where he was. So he had some family issues. And we know that Judas betrayed him. So he felt the betrayal. He felt the pain. He felt the pain of the cross. He felt separation from God there for a moment as he literally hung there suspended between heaven and earth with the weight of the world's sins upon his shoulders. Jesus literally felt all of those things, which is great because Hebrews says that Jesus is qualified to be our high priest because he can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He was in all points, all points. Everybody say all points. All points means all points. He was tempted in all points like as we were, yet he didn't sin. So think about temptation. Think about sin. Every time the enemy comes or your flesh rises up and tries to entice you to do something wrong, Jesus literally was tempted in all areas. We see that actually in the Gospel of Luke. Right after Jesus' baptism, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down, uh, descends upon him in the form of a dove, and the very next verse says, And the Spirit drove him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus is there, he's fasting, and the enemy comes and he tempts him with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The Bible says all types of sin flow through those, uh, from those three different roots, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. But yet Jesus overcame every single one of those. Why? Because he was God in the flesh and he was our example. So tonight, as we take all of that into perspective, I want to read what the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Coloss about Jesus. So I want, you to, I want you to look at this, and I'm going to show you what a man who is in love with his creator sounds like. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. We're going to read verse, through verse 18. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, 
fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, his, of the Son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. And everybody said, amen. That's a great prayer right there. So I, don't, I, don't, I, I couldn't pray any greater prayer as a pastor. Now, Paul was an apostle, was apostle at that day, uh, in that day of time. You know, there were 12 apostles, and then here comes Paul. And, and of course, there are apostolic functions and gifts all throughout church history. But these foundational apostles their job was to go in and start churches and set up new works and be kind of the forerunners and breaking ground and tilling hard places. And Paul certainly did that. Paul went in and he established new works. And as a single man, he was a tent maker and went in and did all the various things that he needed to do. But among that, they would oftentimes plant these churches and then they would pastor them for a little while until they raised somebody up. And then Paul would write or come back and visit and talk to these people because he had a covenant relationship with them and I love his heart because look at what Paul says in verse number nine just to break this down a little bit Paul says for this reason since the day we heard it I don't cease to pray for you so the first thing I want you to see is Paul carried a burden for the church in his heart and that's the heart of a shepherd is to carry the church in his heart but notice what Paul said he said I pray that you be filled with knowledge do you know that's my prayer for every person that's here, that's uh, per receiving from God, that coming to the table of the Lord and, and growing in their walk with God, is to be filled with all knowledge of His will in all wisdom and understanding. And then look at what he says in verse 10, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, being fruitful. Man, I love the way Paul breaks all of that down. But then we get down into... Verse number 12, and Paul's prayer begins to shift. I want to give you some background in just a moment because I love this. Paul says, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. That's important because there's a lot of people who try to qualify themselves. Amen. You missed a good place to say amen right there. A lot of people try to qualify themselves by what they do, but you have to remember the gospel is not about what you did. It's about what Jesus did. He qualifies us. It's his righteousness, it's his redemption, it's his blood. But yet on the inside, he does change us. But notice here, he says, who's qualified us to be what? Partakers of the inheritance of the saints. If you really want to shout, you better go see what the inheritance of the saints is. Amen. And there's a lot of people not partaking. You know, the Bible says my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Amen. My people perish for a lack of knowledge. You know, every once in a while in Arkansas, in Oklahoma and different states, Louisiana, I think I saw it before, uh, they have this thing called unclaimed property. And when we were in Arkansas, I saw this commercial that came on the news, and it said, you know, your, your, you personally or your business could have some unclaimed property. And they listed that within the, you know, the, the Arkansas State Treasurer's Office. There was these hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of unclaimed monies that people had never went and got. And one day I was sitting at my desk at the church and, and um, I said, you know, I'm going to look up our church. And, you know, I found our church like, I think it was like two or $3,000 we didn't know we had. And, you know, we needed something at that moment. I think we used it for some speakers or something like that. But see, the truth is I had it the whole time and didn't know it. And a lot of people have a lot of stuff in Christ, but they don't access it because they don't know. Amen stupidity hurts the body of christ that's why paul said first corinthians chapter 11 concerning spiritual things brothers i would not have you to be ignorant amen that was a side trail right there but it's the truth 
Paul's praying, and he says we've been qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints who has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of light, uh, into the kingdom of the son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then in verse 15, Paul starts talking about Jesus. He's the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And he starts talking about how he's the creator of all things and that through all things were created for him, by him, and in him all things pull together and hold together. Paul is looking at his Savior, and man, he is describing the one in whom he loves. This is a man who has had an encounter with Christ. It's a man who's had an encounter with Christ. Men, those of you who have ever had a long-time girlfriend or a wife that you've been married to that you adore, man, you know you can describe her, what she looks like, smells like, wives, you same thing. You know, it's because there's something about being inundated with this person who you are in a relationship with. And that's exactly the way the Apostle Paul was. I love the way that he describes his relationship with Jesus. This was a man who did not have a a casual walk with God. There's a lot of people who have a casual walk with God. They are uh, um, what we call uh, MEC Christians, Mother's Day, Easter, and Christmas. Amen. We see the church feel more on Mother's Day, Easter, and Christmas most times because people, some people have a casual walk with God. Paul didn't have a casual walk with God. Paul had an extraordinary walk with God. This was a man who was a terrorist. He was literally killing, the Bible records it, he was pulling Christians out of their homes, literally separating men and women uh, from each other, separating children from their homes, dragging people off to be beaten in prison and killed. And one day he's minding his own business. And the book of Acts records that on the street called Straight on the Road to Damascus, I wish we would get on the road to Damascus. Amen? That went <laughs> over some of his head right there. Demask us. Do I need to explain? Okay, here we go. So he was on the road to Damascus. And the Bible says he was knocked down by a bright light. He heard a voice and he saw no one. And when he began to cry out, the Lord said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Why do you kick against the pricks? Or one translation says, why do you kick against the goads? In other words, Paul was, Saul was persecuting the church, but Jesus said that was persecuting him. And I want you to know something. When you mess, listen, all of you mamas know this. If you mess with my kids, you mess with me. All you daddies know. If you mess with my kids, you mess with me. And here's what Jesus was saying. Why are you persecuting me? Because when Paul was messing with the church, he was messing with Jesus himself. And here, this man had an encounter. It was a divine call from God. He was struck blind. This dude named Ananias comes and lays hands on him. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. He receives his sight back. And now the whole early church for the several uh, months and years go by think that this guy's some Russian spy who has infiltrated the government. <laughs> I'm, that was a joke there, too. Come on, y'all. Uh, they, 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 they thought he was espionage. They didn't believe his conversion. They thought he was crazy. He had to prove himself. He had to get along with God. And, and man, I'm telling you, Paul became this man who was in love with Jesus. So much so that he wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, most of it from which was written behind prison bars. Not the prison system you and I know. Not the one where there's, uh, the, like the prison that I visited in Louisiana several years ago doing a crusade down there. And I walked, you know, into this minimal security prison and there was pool tables and bingo tables. And no, not, not that prison. Not, not the prison that there are, you know, barber shops behind closed doors and basketball courts. Yes, it, listen, there's a reason why some people go to prison because it's better to go to prison than to be homeless. At least you get three meals and a hot and a, and a bed and a shower. But that's neither here nor there. I'm not talking about that kind of prison. I'm talking about the Roman type of prison where they drop you down into the ground. A lot of times into a cistern where there's water one and a half to two feet deep at all times. And it's not just regular tap water, it's wastewater. I'm trying to be kind tonight. Where the guards would come through and drop your food down. And, and Paul, even through all of that, never denied Christ, but yet wrote 
in his letters about the beauty of the Lord. And, and this is what it's like when somebody encounters God. They encounter him in such a way that they can describe him to the T. And I thought it was so fitting as we begin to talk about the incarnation and God being with us. I've entitled this teaching tonight simply, This is Jesus. Because that's what Paul began to tell us about as he prayed for the church and his prayer began to flow into his walk with God. And, and let's simply look at this together tonight. Look at verse 14 with me. Paul says it like this. As, as he talks about him being delivered from the power of darkness, conveyed into the kingdom of the Son of his love. Verse 14, look at this. It says, In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. See, the first thing Paul told us tonight about Christ, number one, is that Christ is our Redeemer. This is Jesus. He is our Redeemer. The word redemption, it simply means to be bought back or to regain control. When, when something is redeemed, it is purchased. And Paul began to speak about Christ through whom we have redemption. And this redemption comes because when sin entered into the world and Adam and Eve broke fellowship with God and the curse came into the world, at that moment death entered. And not just physical death, but spiritual death. Which, by the way, the book of Revelation talks about spiritual death being the second death, which is the lake of fire. That's what... Uh, Adam and Eve had to look forward to uh, and that's why God instituted the sacrifices to try to get man back on track and and so now we see throughout the Old Testament this plan of redemption and and, and it's going through with doves and sin offerings and heave offerings and and sins of omission and sins of commission and he got them laying hands on goats in the wilderness the scapegoats and sending them off into the wilderness we see all of this play back in the Old Testament of man's sin and God's righteousness and God's desire for man to have a relationship with him but Paul looks through the lens of where we are on this side of the cross to the church at Colossus, and here's what Paul said Christ is our redeemer by his own blood he has redeemed us and given us the forgiveness of sins now notice this in whom we have redemption through his blood now Romans chapter 6 verse 23 is an amazing scripture to me if you were never taught the Romans road of salvation growing up man you, you should learn that as an adult it's a good thing to be able to share somebody the pathway of salvation Paul writes to the church at Rome he says for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord I like the way one translation says that the New King James says the wages of sin is death but I think it's the amplified it says that the the, the wage that sin pays is death but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Jesus brought eternal redemption through his precious blood. Do you understand tonight that the reason why Christ being fully God and fully man is so important and the reason why the, what we would call the immaculate conception, Christ being born of a virgin, is so important because the primary DNA of a person comes through the bloodline of their father. And here's the thing. Jesus wasn't born of an earthly father. So the sin nature wasn't passed down through the genealogy of Christ because it came through Mary, the virgin womb. The fact that Christ's blood brought redemption is because his blood was pure. His blood was holy. Amen. I could get into this whole thing tonight, and I won't do it. I will behave myself. But at, at, there's a reason why in Passover they had to get the leaven out of their house. Leaven represents sin, right? They had to sweep it out. They had to get it out and, and uh, all of those things. And, and um, the, the leaven, you know, would be in the bread, and that would be the bread that they would eat at communion. Also, the Lord's Supper and the Last Supper would be communion. And so it was unleavened bread. But how many of you know uh, alcohol has leaven in it? It's how they ferment it. So why would Jesus' blood have leaven in it? Hmm. Doesn't work, does it? If his body has leaven in it, 
then he's sinful. So why would his blood have leaven in it? No, it was unleavened for a reason. And Jesus said, you won't drink of the fruit of the vine again until I come with you and my Father in his kingdom. So anyway, uh, just something for you to think about. But Christ is our redeemer. What have we been redeemed from? We've been redeemed from sin. And what does that look like? In the Old Testament, there was uh, separation from God. Uh, there was a uh, curse that smote the earth where things that were easy and, and um, very normal to do, like work and things like that. See, work didn't happen after the curse. Work was before the curse. And I hate to burst your bubble. Everybody who thinks we're going to be in uh, eternal retirement in heaven, there's work in heaven. I've got scripture for you if you don't believe me. We're going to be doing stuff. Now, the cool thing is if, if, you, uh, if you make the rapture before the millennial reign, you're going to have a glory, glorified body, and uh, you, know, you may be able to space travel or something like Jesus walking through walls. I don't know how that'll work. It'll be pretty cool, but we will be doing stuff. We won't be on clouds, and we won't be playing the harps, and we won't have little baby diapers with pins in them. Come on. How many of you glad about that? No, we're not going to do that. We're going to have jobs and assignments in heaven the new jerusalem we're going to go in and out and worship god and have an amazing eternity but there will be no curse that's what you have to understand the curse is what makes the earth bad you know sickness came from the curse there was no sickness before adam and eve ate the fruit there was no poverty before adam and eve ate the fruit they just I, they simply picked a, a pomegranate or a banana or something and one grew right back no pesticide everything was organic in god's original design that's the way he designed it to be. And so, you know, the ground, everything was cursed, and, and then we've got death and spiritual separation from God and all of those things. And, and you know what the Bible says that Christ, Galatians chapter, I believe it's chapter 4, says Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Man, redemption purchases salvation, and salvation encompasses so much. You should go look up the word in the Greek sometimes. It's a great word. Christ is our redeemer i don't want to get bogged down there i have still have some ground to go tonight look at verse 15 with me verse 15 i love this it says for he is the image of the in, uh, of the invisible god the firstborn over all creation i want to stop there i don't want to go too much further but number one i told you number one that christ was our redeemer number two i'll tell you christ is our pattern christ is our pattern he is the image of the invisible God. I recall the story tonight as I'm sitting here and, and thinking in my mind. The disciples said, Lord, show us the Father. He said, Philip, have I been so long with you that you haven't seen me? For if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, and me and my Father, we are one. See, you would call that oneness. Now, that freaks out a lot of people who are Trinitarians. But I'm not saying that, uh, you know, the no, there's God in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. They are all distinct, but yet all God. Interesting how that works. But they were in perfect union. See, the word oneness, it just simply means union. And Jesus was the image of the invisible God. So what does that mean? Christ is our pattern. There are a lot of people who, you know, they want to, you know, pattern their lives after different things. But I'm going to ask you tonight, who do you pattern your life after? If you pattern your life off of anybody but Jesus, people will fail you. Even Billy Graham has sinned in, in his life. Even Mother Teresa has thought thoughts that she shouldn't think. Even your grandma, who was a saint, who built this church and whatever, you know, and did missionary work and all those things, they weren't perfect people. Godly, yes, but perfect, no. Jesus was the only one that was perfect. He got it right every single time. Every single time he hit the bullseye, he never missed the mark. He was God's perfect standard. Jesus was God's pattern. And I would say to you tonight that he's the one that we should be patterning our lives after. That's why Paul wrote to the church at Galatia also, and he said, I've labored and travailed like a mother in childbirth until Christ be formed in you. In other words, the older we get and the more mature we get, I'm not talking about just physically, but spiritually, we ought to look a little bit more like Jesus. 
Matter of fact, the reason why God gave you a pastor, the reason why God sends teachers and evangelists and whatnot is for the equipping of the saints until we all come into unity, until we come into the full stature of the measure of Christ. That means we're supposed to be looking like Jesus. Christ is our pattern. Here's the thing. If you ever wanted to know what the will of God is, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus. If you ever wanted to know how God would deal with a sinner, look at Jesus. If you ever wanted to know how God would deal with a demon-possessed person, look at Jesus. If you ever wanted to know how God would deal with a sick person, look at Jesus. If you ever wanted to know how God would disciple, look at Jesus. He was the perfect prototype and model that God set before us. He is the image of the invisible God. He's actually what allowed us to see God in the flesh. Then it goes a little further. Look at verse 16 with me. 16 and 17. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers of all things created were, were created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things cons- consist. Now, hold your finger right there and go over with me to Genesis, the book of beginnings, chapter number one. We're going to play Bible trivia real quick. I want somebody to holler out. Who wrote the book of Genesis? Huh? Moses. Okay. What's the first book in the Bible? Genesis. What's the oldest book in the Bible? Job, somebody said it right. I was messing with you there. All right. Do you know, let me tell you something as we turn over to Genesis. How many of you know Moses wasn't alive when this was wrote, when this, when this happened? You know that, right? I mean, you know, the Bible tells us about when Moses was born, you know. Moses wasn't born. So when, where did Moses, where did Moses get this? We know it was by divine revelation. But do you know, let me tell you where Moses got this? Most people believe this to be true, and I happen to be one of them. When, you remember when God hid Moses in the cleft of the rock, and he said, I'm going to put my hand over you, and I'm going to allow my goodness to pass before you? I believe God downloaded everything to him right there. Amazing. Somebody say amazing. That's amazing. Christ, our creator. This messes with people because it especially messes with the religious like we talked about last week. How Jesus would say, Jesus said oftentimes before Abraham was, I am. It was a, the equating with deity that got him in trouble most of the time. It, it was Jesus that said, which is easier to say, your sin's forgiven or, or rise up and walk. So that's what was the issue. All right, so let, let's go to Genesis chapter 1 for a second. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You don't have to put this on the screen. I'm throwing them a kink back there. But anyway, here we go. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw the light. And, you know, all of that, God began to see all of those things, and he began to speak them into existence. But I want you to look with me at verse number 26. Verse number 26 says, Then God said, Let us. Everybody say us. You see how us is capitalized? The reason why it's capitalized is because it's talking about deity. So notice this. Christ was there at creation. In other words, he did not become the... He, he became the in flesh son of God through the womb of Mary, but he's always existed as the eternal word, the eternal son of God. And notice that he said in verse 26, let us make man in our image and according to our likeness. Christ is our creator. Why is this significant? Because creation, being creator, makes him equal with God. It makes him the owner of all things. He is the possessor of all things. And notice, I want you to notice, it says that all things are subject to his power. Principalities, powers, dominions, on the earth, under the earth, everything is under his power, which makes sense because the Bible says that (laughs) there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. That the name of Jesus, 
Every knee should bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And, and listen, it doesn't matter where they are, uh, above the earth, on the earth, under the earth, in the heavens. It really doesn't matter tonight. Christ is our creator, which tells us that he is equal with God. He is, he is God just as much as the Holy Spirit is God and the Father is God. Jesus is God. And it shows us that he is the owner of all things and that all things were created for him and by him now i want you to notice something all things were created for him say for him you know what that tells us nothing in and of itself is evil in its nature only when it becomes or chooses to be evil god created everything for himself and i love this it says in him all things exist one translation says all things through him hold together. In other words, Jesus is the glue that holds this whole earth together. How many of you know you take Jesus out of the mix and all of this stuff will just go away? Be bad stuff. But through him, all things hold together. Christ is our creator. I want to finish with this last part tonight as we see a little bit uh, lower down here. Notice with me what he says in verse number 18. Verse number 18, it says, And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence, which basically means preeminence means the importance, the forefront. He is, he is what it's all about. Now, Christ is our redeemer. Christ is our pattern. Christ is our creator. But number four, I want to say it like this, Christ is our leader. Notice what he said, that he is the head of the body. The head of the body. You know what? Your head is very important. Amen? You know, they, they, there's an old statement that says, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. You know why that is, right? Because there's nerves. Same thing with the snake. They run around for a little while. There's really no life there. It's just the nerves kind of reacting give you another real life illustration uh having lived in louisiana uh, for central louisiana for for five years we learned to eat a lot of weird things you know bugs like mud bugs and frogs and stuff like that you know frogs you, you eat frog legs you know they're pretty good they taste like chicken you know it's the other white meat but uh, you know if you put a little salt in the pan on those frog legs they'll go to jumping like they're alive You know, I want to say that, and I said all that to say this, that's just all, it's all, it's not real. They're not really alive. It's the nerves that are reacting in the body. And you know what? There's a lot of motion a lot of times going on spiritually and whatever, but it's just motion because Christ is not at the head. Christ is the head of the church, and the, the head is significant to our physical body because that's where our brain is right you 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 see somebody and i don't mean to be insensitive to anybody who's lost a loved one but one one of the ways that they conclude that it's time to take somebody off of life support is when there's no brain activity because the brain is what controls the rest of the body christ is the head that means we can't exist without him then paul goes on to tell us that we are the body of christ not individually but together he says that you know some are a hand some are a foot some are an eye you know, different parts of the body. Some are seen, like our hands. Some are unseen, like other things. And, and Paul begins to talk about the importance of everything working together. And then Paul says this. He says, until every joint supplies, every piece is hooked together, and it has a purpose. We, collectively, as the body of Christ, make up the body of Christ. But Christ, Paul was sure to say it like this. Christ is the head in other words, that means he's the boss. Amen. He's the, head of the, he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. You know, the, the church that thrives the most is the one where Jesus is in charge. Amen. You know, every church split, every time... You know, things happen in the world, and you see things that churches are just struggling a lot of times and, and fighting and infighting, fussing and all these things. It's because Jesus isn't the head. Man's got involved, and people are fighting over preference and fighting over this and fighting over that. And, 
and 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 you know i, I heard a fight one time uh, there was a picture uh hanging in the back of this methodist church and and uh anyway it, it was an i'll just say it it was an ugly picture but it had a it had a plaque on it somebody donated it like 50 years ago and you know the preacher moved it and they liked to took his head off you know it doesn't matter that he grew the church by like a hundred people and there was hardly anybody there when he got there and all these new families were there but he he moved grandma's picture of jesus and almost got crucified like him so anyway it was pretty interesting true st- y'all don't believe stuff like that happens oh let me tell you some stories but stuff like that happens people get bent out of shape when jesus is not the head and when jesus is the head let me tell you what's on his mind souls tell you what's on jesus mind deliverance tell you what's on jesus mind missions tell you what's on jesus mind getting people baptized in the holy spirit let me tell you what's on jesus mind loving one another let me tell you what's on jesus mind forgiveness amen i can go on and on and on but i love how paul's praying this prayer and he gives us this pretty picture of the church and how god has done all these things man he's redeemed us his blood and and all of those things and then he steps back and says yep and he's the head of the church that through him he might have all the preeminence in other words jesus is the focus tonight we looked at this god with us this is jesus our Redeemer.